welcome back to another episode of the Private Practice Growth Club YouTube channel. On this channel, we talk all things private practice in South Africa. So if that's something that you're into, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and also hit the bell for notifications of new videos. Today, I have a lovely guest. Her name is Rachel Carey, and she's an occupational therapist in private practice. But we're not actually going to be talking so much about her private practice as some of the side hustles she has on the side. I've always maintained that as an occupational therapist, we have such diverse skills and we tend to always want to be doing all kinds of things. And um, I know for me personally, I ascribe a lot of things that I've done and been able to, you know, to explore due to my uh, training as an occupational therapist. So I actually just wanted to bring Rachel on to talk about how we can actually use our professional knowledge and professional skills and experience in areas outside of uh, private practice to also uh, explore other avenues of generating revenue. So welcome, Rachel, and thank you so much for being here and joining me today. Hi, Tasneem. Thank you so much for having me. So um, let's start off with you maybe just telling us a little bit more about yourself, who you are, your background, how you became an OT, that kind of stuff. So I am a children's occupational therapist and I am, I, I got here in a bit of a roundabout way. I actually started studying law when I left school. Um, my strongest subjects were English and history and I was, yeah, I was good at debating um, and I liked Ellie McBeal, so I thought, why not? Um, and then You're after giving away your age now. I know, I know, <laughs> giving away my age. So after a year of studying BA law, which I absolutely loved, I was majoring in English and history, and it was it was it was a really great year of growth for me. And um, people were sort of asking me, well, what type of law do you want to go into? Um, and so I kind of started looking at these questions and thinking, like, where do I actually see myself going in my life? Um, and I was just really struck by the fact that I didn't, I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, and I had always, like, I've always loved uh, the natural sciences. I always loved biology at school. Uh, so, and I, I guess I've also, I've always, I've always known about OT. Both my sister and my brother were in occupational therapy when, when they were children. Uh, my brother um, has a sort of quite significant uh, ADHD and my sister was in OT for sort of postural things. Um, so I'd always known about it. Um, and, but I actually, I went, I actually, I actually filled in application forms and thought I would do physio. And okay. then I went to the UCT, I'm from Cape Town, I went to the UCT Open Day uh, for the health sciences. And I sat there and I had all my forms filled in for physio. And um, I think I, I liked the sort of quantifiable aspect of physio. Um, and uh, someone spoke, one of my lecturers, or well, she went on to become one of my lecturers. She spoke. Which she, lecturer was this? I was uh, at Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, well, so is now the transformation that you did. You said, you yes, I know. Which is amazing. <laughs> and I can't think of a better person for the job. Um, and she spoke about um, play and children and working in play and the passion with which she spoke, mm. it was just, I mean, you know, when she smiles, it's like mm. oh, the sun shines mm. and the, the passion with which she spoke. And I, I looked at her and I was like, this is someone who is completely fulfilled. And mm. this is something that is so beautiful. And, um, and I went home and I changed all my forms. <laughs> and I put, <laughs> I put OT as my, as, my, as my number one choice and physio as my second. And I submitted and I was accepted. So that's kind of how I got onto the OT path. Um, and uh, I didn't know that I would work with, with children. Um, I had always worked, like I, I, would, I did an outreach program in Dunoon Township as a student and with, with children. And I, um, and I worked at the Virgin Active Junior Care and I babysat a lot. So I've always loved children and I've always had a good sort of rapport with them. And I've always felt that um, I'm far more forgiving of children than I am of adults. Uh, so <laughs> looking back now, I see that it was the natural progression, but, but I, I enjoyed the other work that I did in my concert mm. year. And, and then I went, went and worked in the UK and I, I did some uh, sort of orthopedics there. And I, I was always very fascinated by hands. Um, but I, I think if I was always going to end up in Peds. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. then, um, and, and Peds is, is one of the most amazing things. And I'm so, I feel so grateful because if you do go on to become a mother or father, um, it's like this amazing gift because mm -hmm. 
you've been you you so you know child development so intimately and then you have your own children and you just watch it unfold and you watch the play and you you have some background in what's happening in the brain and then you you see it live day to day mm. um, and it's just, I mean, it's just been the most fabulous gift. I mean, I can get excited about, often my friends are like, oh, aren't you a bit bored? And I'm like, no, but look what's happening. Yeah. So I think, so that's been an incredible gift. And it's been a gift to me as a mother um, and a gift to me as an OT, because I think mm. I've changed my practice a lot since becoming a mother. Mm. Um, I think I understand the context of OT more, the context yeah. of what we are offering children more. And I think I also... Um, I, I think this is actually where, you know, your passion really comes alive. Mm. And if you can have a side hustle that's a passion well, then, you know, that's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that was the path of OT for me. And I've been in pediatrics now probably about 15 years. Um, yeah. And on, on and off, and, you know, I, I, I stopped for a while when I had kids. And, and I've done, um, so I, I think becoming a mum has really showed me the importance of, of, of training, of parent mm. training and teacher training. Um, yeah. And when my youngest was sick, he, uh, I mean, when he was small, he was quite, he was quite unwell. Um, so I went back into to clinical private practice, but it's difficult, you know, it's, mm. it's a struggle anyway as a mom. And I was having to cancel patients and or mm. clients. And, um, so I took a job with a, a company that did educational resources and I headed up their teacher training portfolio which is really nice. And I, I realized within me was this passion for training, mm. um, which I wouldn't have known if my journey hadn't sort of gone that way. Yeah. Um, and, and I really, I love it. I love the training. I love sharing the knowledge. Um, and, and it's amazing how you don't necessarily see yourself going in a certain mm. way. And then when you look back, it kind of seems that it was an inevitable. Like it was um, obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and um and then when lockdown happened, they the company closed down their um their training branch because it wasn't a money generator. It was yeah. it was to teach teachers about the sort of developmental properties of the yes. of the products they were selling. Um so and then and then I was in this situation where I was home with my boys and I had friends all around the world saying to me, oh, we're stuck at home with our children. What do we do? <laughs> yeah. So I, I was like, well, I'm doing it with my boys anyway. Let me just sort of blog about it or post about it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and from that was born sort of Rachie OT mum, this mm. sort of hybrid of mum and, and OT. And yeah. that's kind of just evolved really organically. Um, and and but in doing that, it was just such a reminder to me about how that sort of universal role, that health promotion, that occupational yeah. um, richness of life is so important. And, mm. and sharing that is really a, such a passion for me. Um, mm. And so from that kind of developed my, my own training brand, mm. um, uh, which I really so I wanted to say, like, you know, it's interesting – um, a lot of occupational therapists I find have that same story where they never have ever like, you know, like most people like, oh, I want to be a teacher when I finish yeah. school. Oh, I want to be a whatever. <laughs> um, it's like OT is never the thing that you like, oh, when you're in high school, I'm going to be an occupational therapist. There's like a rare few that, yeah. have, that, that have that. Most OTs come about it in a roundabout way. I wanted to be either a teacher or a pediatrician. And I was actually just telling somebody yesterday that um, if I think about it now, I was never interested in medicine and I would never want to be a doctor because what I was after was that relationship building. Mm, I'm not yeah. interested in just curing somebody. Yeah. And what appealed to me with the OT was that it was so holistic, you know, yeah. that it was about more than just fixing something about the person. Um, yeah. And a lot of the teaching comes in, the coaching comes in, all of that comes in and there's, and occupational therapy has such a huge role in advocacy, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Alawani is a prime example, all the work she's yeah. done in occupational apartheid, occupational deprivation. These are all terms that are unique to the occupational science and occupational therapy yeah. profession. Um, and I follow a lot of OTs in the States and in the UK, and there's a lot of um, OTs that are really heavily involved in, like, um, advocacy around um, gender issues, around... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, equality, about social issues. Um, there's there's OTs in like India and things like that who are really addressing uh, cultural bias and things like that. And that is all core to how we are trained as OTs, which makes yeah. 
on the one hand, it's such a beautiful and diverse profession, but on the other hand, it's part of the reason why it's so difficult to explain to people what occupational therapy actually yes. is. Um, so it's like a double-edged sword. And like you were saying, you know, she was so passionate. And I find that most OTs who are actually like doing the work they love are so passionate about the profession. I actually posted a story the other day that I shared from this account called uh, WTFOT. What the fuck is OT? And she posts <laughs> memes about it all the time. And the one meme was this little, you know, Kathy and Mark kind of readers, kind yes, of characters. Yes. And the two characters are running away from the one who's coming out the door. And she's saying, hurry, before he tells us all about uh, occupational therapy again. <laughs> that, that is Go like on. once you get started. And so yeah. I actually avoid the question when people ask, what is OT? because I know I'm going to get go on to a tangent and then yeah. they're going to like, be running away from me because yeah, I'm still absolutely. telling you all the absolutely. things that we do. Um, so yeah, and that is why we have such a diverse set of skills. Why OTs can actually go into like corporate and um, you know do training, like you say, it doesn't have to necessarily be therapeutic. Yeah. Um, and then I also loved what you said about like how you know when you became a mom, it's because now you not only seeing it from a the eyes like a new set of eyes from the child's perspective but you also understand parents like you understand their schedules and why they're not able to always follow the home programs you give them you have a lot more empathy for the parents because you know how busy they are and how difficult it is and what they are are struggling with and then also that you then decided to share your knowledge through this wonderful new world of online that we now have available to us and I've seen quite a few OTs who are not even practicing as OTs, but in their bio, it will say they OT mom. And I'm like, oh, yep. you're an occupational therapist because <laughs> yeah. they're all bloggers about like parenting and activities. Yeah. And they're not saying it from an OT point of view. It's yeah. just one of the hashtags is that. So I know that this from an <laughs> OT point of view. Um, and so it's like just sharing that health promotion, the knowledge, the education. Um, so that's amazing. Um, that you actually found that and you actually use that because I think a lot of people have the idea but they're just too afraid to like well, put it's it out daunting. there yeah mm. once you put it out there it's daunting and yeah and um, and also we as parents we're evolving the whole time hey so mm. you you might put out something and then you kind of you put it out into the ether you feel it's kind of it's etched there it's, it's gonna stay but we don't always we don't always like maybe that didn't actually work as a parent and so we we don't actually agree with that anymore maybe we learn more and we know more but yeah and I, I think that this is kind of this is one of the thing there are a lot of um sort of perfect parenting um images out there and I, I just you know from the get-go my um my I, sort of motivation behind it was I don't want to make any other parent feel horrible. Um, mm. And I want it to be like, if you find it useful, follow it. But actually parenting's hard and we all get stuff wrong. Even those mm. of us who are trained as OTs and child development, whatever, we, we also get it wrong. And, mm. um, and it's all about learning for all of us. And if you just bring it back to that relationship, um, that's the most important thing. Well, for me, that's the most important thing. And, uh, and we're un- unlearning a whole lot of stuff that our brains have modeled and learned. And, and, uh, and so that's why I guess I, um, I've, got, I've got friends, I've made friends in this, this sort of social media journey. And if you look at their grids and stuff, they just look beautiful. Mm. Um, and like, so they laugh at me sometimes. They're like, Rach, come on, you've got to, you've got to like, make it look a bit better. And I'm like, to be honest, <laughs> yeah. one, I don't have that skill set yet. Yeah. I, mean, I probably could if I tried. But two, I don't want it to look better because mm. actually parenting doesn't look good. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, and, and I don't want anyone to feel less of a parent. I want it to mm. be about, um, yeah, just about learning things and being open to new ideas and to go in, okay, so we all change and evolve and mess up mm. and don't mess up and get some things right. And, and we all have different children and we are, yeah. yeah, the experts on our own children. Yeah, there was a post that I saw that was recent, like where you posted about like a really bad day that you had, where <laughs> yes. you snapped at your kids and things like that. And it was like, you know, because it's so relatable because we all have it. Like you say, yeah. even if you know the like even if you're like a psychologist or a yeah, yeah. you know whatever parenting expert you're gonna have your days where you're gonna do all the wrong things and that's yeah. okay as long as yeah. you have you you then recognize it and you look at okay how could you have done things differently and yeah. this is the reasons and all of that and not just like you know ignore it and sweep it on the carpet but 
it's okay to have those days and you're going to I mean I shout at my children all the time oh, um so like you know lo- I lose my I lose my shit all the time <laughs> so <laughs> it's like it, and, and it's okay you know as long as like you say you build that relationship and you you repair the, the if there's mm. any trust that's been broken with your children and you, you repair that and the communication and then that's where your skills come in and in fact if you think about it as an expert or a therapist or a clinician or whatever it is about that. It's about how do you constantly evolve and improve and, um, you know, adapt to things that's changing. It's not about making things perfect because Absolutely. there is no such yeah. thing as perfect. Yeah. Perfection yeah. is a fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I did a saying somewhere that said, uh, when you like perfection is death or something because it means yeah. you stop growing. Yeah, there's, there's growing. nothing more to improve, so you might as well just die. So tell me, uh, before we get into some of like the other things that you've done outside of clinical practice, you mentioned like you have been in private practice. So tell us a little bit about um, the private practice side of things and the the journey in private practice. What are some of the biggest struggles that you've had or the biggest lessons you've learned in private practice? So um, so I did my comms here and then I went to the UK and I worked for the NHS for a long time and then I worked for a charity. So when I came back to South Africa, private practice didn't, I didn't feel comfortable, I guess, because I'd never actually taken money from someone. Uh, you know, I'd always had a salary. Um, yeah. The parents that I was seeing weren't paying me for my services um, directly. So, so when I first came back, I kind of looked into third sector and um, ways of working so that I could, like I looked at different ways who could fit the, fit, you know, fit the bill and, um but I also realized that the um, the landscape in South Africa is quite different mm. um, and that uh, if I wanted sort of supervision and I wanted to learn from people, um, I would have to position myself uh, in such a way that I was exposed to people that, that had skill sets that I wanted to learn from, um, which can be hard in private practice as well. And then I became a mother in all of this. So um I started when I when we first moved back, I was in Cape Town and I started with a practice that um, had a lot of floor time therapists because I had a bit of exposure to floor time training and I wanted to learn more about it. Um, and and that was it was a very rich experience. And I started realizing that and I guess I guess because when you work for the NHS, um, which is obviously sponsored by the government, funded by the mm. government you kind of develop a bit of resistance to taking money for your services. So I, mm. I think I had to, I had to go through the understanding. And my mom kept saying to me, you know, she's kept saying, well, your brother wouldn't have had services if they weren't private practice OTs. Um, mm. I, I kind of wrongly had this feeling that I was kind of selling out if I went into private mm. practice. Mm. Um, and, but I wanted to know more about floor time. So I positioned myself to, to work alongside a therapist, you know, to see if this is a, a journey I wanted to commit to. And in that, I got to know these children that really needed a lot of help and support and parents that also needed a lot of help and support. And it didn't matter who was paying, really. That wasn't the important mm. thing. Uh, so that kind of got me over that hurdle. Um, and then, as I said, I, then, then I moved up to KZN when my little baby was 10 weeks old. Um, and I started in private practice uh, working with a, an experienced therapist here as well. Um, and then I went on the journey of going into um, teacher training when my son was not very well. Um, and then when lockdown happened and they stopped the teacher training um, and now both my children were at school in the mornings, I was like, well, what am I going to do? And I, it, it was quite scary for me because I hadn't been in private practice for mm. a while. Um and there's an amazing uh, uh, practice here called Clay Occupational Therapy, and one of their um, one of their therapists was going on maternity leave, and one was moving to the UK, and they sort of approached me and said, "Would you be interested in maybe picking up a bit of work?" And I, I it was just I fell back into it, and it was amazing. Mm. And I just mm. I remembered what I love about it, and now I had this new perspective because I mm. had this journey of becoming a mother and doing training, and so there was quite a shift in how I practiced. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I realized uh, was the importance of the relationship and that mm. a child is on an island. And I think that I 
previously my my um my therapy was a lot more around my actual therapy session mm. um and as you say giving home programs and expecting those to be followed up mm. um and i think that uh, in this transformation uh, just realizing in private practice that what is so important is the buy in from the parents and the parents mm. are really understanding what i'm doing with their child uh, yeah. because you know, maybe they can't sit down and do it every day in a home program format but if they really understand what what is happening in the brain and why i'm mm. doing it with their child and why it's so important um, well, then they can work it into the day, you know, then yes. they can say, go get your toothbrush. Okay, let's do bear walks, you know, mm. whatever, yeah. because they know they're working on weight bearing through the shoulders or they're working on bilateral integration or, um, and those things mean something to them. I mean, none of us yeah. do things that aren't meaningful. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess that, um, that private practice has become far more rich for me because I understand that. Mm. Um, and and th that th this relationship with the parents and the whole family and the teacher is just so key to helping children. Yeah. Um, and the therapy, yes, it's important. It's a piece of the puzzle, but that there are lots of pieces to this puzzle. And, and you get, you get taught that, right? You yeah. definitely get taught that at university. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm not saying I negated that side of, of it before as a, as a, a clinician, but it definitely, um, it's definitely far more important to, to me now. And I understand mm. the significance of it far more. Yeah. Uh, so I've really enjoyed that evolution of, of my clinical practice. And I'm still with Clay. Um, it, it's a beautiful practice on the North coast of KZN. And um, I really like how open they are to different ideas. I, you know, it, I think, you know, I think it all comes down to that activity analysis that you get taught as, as, as an OT. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so often I'll see something and I'm like, yo, that would be so awesome for this and this and this. So mm. um, Claire's a really nice practice to work under because uh, they're so open to me and my ideas. So for example, <laughs> I sat in the, on a class observation um, uh, once in, in, at a school and um, the music teacher came in. It was an early years class and she did this amazing, amazing lesson. And I sat there mm. and I was like, this was just phenomenal. And I approached her afterwards and I said, listen, We've got to do something together. Like, yeah, yeah. Is, and look at what you're doing with these children. And it is amazing. Um, so the two of us set up a drumming club, a holiday drumming club. And like, and then I started looking into it and like rhythm and timing and sequencing and auditory processing and 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 drumming. And I like I don't have the expertise to do a drumming club, like do it on my own. But if I collaborated with her, I did. And we had this amazing drumming club, and it was so awesome. It was three consecutive days. And I said to Claire, listen, can we host Claire? And they were like, absolutely, go ahead. Yeah. So, so you know, that was, that I really, I'm very happy there because I, I feel I, they're very open to me um, following. Being these, innovative. These yeah. I see. Um, and that's what it is. It, I really think it comes down to activity analysis, which is so yeah. cool to OT, but it just means you see opportunity around you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we really, as as um, OTs, we really undervalue that part of our training, the activity yeah. analysis. But, and I think that I I personally feel that in the undergrad training, they should actually give more time and attention to that because they don't really, you know, highlight it as a major part of. I mean, it's it's almost like it's integrated. It's just part and parcel. It's just do. part of it. Well, but it's, they it's don't. Yeah, but they don't really yeah. make it a hero when actually yeah. that yeah. is what yeah. sets us apart from other Absolutely. people. And it's why yeah. we can actually work in other areas that's not non-therapeutic, like, Absolutely. you know, being job coaches or in wellness programs or yeah. all of these things. And also, I, I, I think what you are also saying, you know, saying that the clay therapy people are so open to your innovations and that it, it also speaks to those people who are starting a practice and looking to evolve is that that's such a key leadership skill to have as a practice owner, because remembering that if you own a practice, you are not just a clinician, you are a business owner. And as a business owner, you are in effectively a leader. And as a leader, so it's not just about you know, everybody goes to the operational skills of how do I bill and how do I, which practice management software, but you also need to think, how do you develop yourself as a boss, as a manager, as, mm -hmm. and, and being open to innovation is so important um, and guiding your, the people who, 
It's not to say that you must just let people do whatever they want. Yeah. How do you then guide them and bring out the best? I mean, I know that is possibly one of the reasons why people end up wanting to go into practice is because they feel stagnant or frustrated in like a government service because there's so much red tape around things. And like, if you know, if you want to do something and it's not always to do with resources. It's so easy to blame it on resources. Oh, there isn't resources. Sometimes there's ways that you can do things and, um, you know, uh, collaborate with outsiders, but because it's now government and then there's yeah. all these, you know, you can't just like have an idea and find a solution because yeah, the solution absolutely. has to first jump over so many hurdles and get so many signatures and like, you know, permissions and things like that. Um, and that's, I found that frustrating working in a school. Like I thought it yeah. would be fun to work in a school and I would have government school holidays days. So I can be at home with my kids, but Fortunately, I had the the deputy was very like she was always open to ideas and things. So we would find a way to like get the principal to approve. But the principal had to because she had to be, um, you know, she had to be very uh, pragmatic and very like every T must be crossed and I's must be dotted because she had to be because there was so much accountability. And let's be honest, there are some teachers in the government service who are just there for the paycheck and they're not really interested in the children. So there was a lot of times where she had to be that way, Mm. but it was very stifling. I found like, you know, and I think a lot of therapists go into private practice for that reason, but seeing that we're on the topic of innovation and like having all these ideas, let's talk about that for a bit. So you've mentioned now like this drumming um, holiday program you had outside of private practice at play therapy what are some of the other what are tell us a bit about this other project that you started um and particularly your book that you published which i find (laughs) is amazing congratulations i still need to um (laughs) send you the money for my copy because i definitely want one so tell us a little bit about about that how it came about um what the process was and all of that so again, it's a, it's another one where you you kind of look and you're like, how did I end up writing a children's book? And then you look <laughs> back and you're like, oh, actually, everything fell into place. So I guess, I mean, I would like to say it started at lockdown, but it didn't. It actually started before that. It started when I was working for Educanda and uh, we used to run these teacher summits. And the one year we ran a teacher summit on fostering emotional intelligence in the classroom and how to use that as Um, managing behavior as opposed to sort of the authoritarian punitive approach. Um, And when we did it, um, it was myself and someone, Anri Erasmus, she's uh, OT in Cape Town. And we were sort of uh, planning what we were going to do the summit uh, content on that year. And she said, look, I know this amazing lady, Shanley Schaefer. She works, she's got this organization called Heart Matters Academy and she runs these social emotional learning groups. And we really, we have to try and incorporate her. So we, so this is how we came up with the topic. And I just learned so much from this woman. I mean, she is amazing. And she, the importance of social emotional learning and, um, and how we can in, in include it for children and how we have to make it intentional. Um, and it was so, uh, it was so important for me as a mother. Um, my one child is quite, is quite anxious um, and just, you know, I was going through the toddler years and like those are difficult years and it's mm. difficult to navigate. And there were so many tools that she taught me and she just put me on this path of, you know, as OTs, um, we very much look at that sensory processing and sensory modulation side of things, mm. but it just made me look more at the emotional processing and emotional modulation and regulation and how those two are so intertwined and you cannot remove them from each other. Mm. Which then of course really made me look at that and consolidate that as a brain and why why that is is in our brains and how you can't hope to be otherwise because that's how our brains are are designed Mm. Um, and looking at my own mental health and my own mental health in relation to you know emotional regulation and then my sensory processing and um and reflecting on my life and so it was really such a journey and so that's that that was a shift in, in in me as an ot and a mother and then when the first lockdown happened um, <clears throat> my sister is this just the most amazing illustrator. She's just a beautiful artist and she lives in France and we were in lockdown and there was so much, there was so much fear. There was so much around, um, uh, you know, what was happening in the strange pandemic. And, um, and so we were chatting one day and, um, she, oh, she'd done some beautiful illustrations. I said, gosh, Bex, you need to, you need to do a children's book. Like you're so talented. 
And she was like, well, I need a story. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I wish we could write a story for children um, with this fear and like what you can tell them. You know, there were so many resources going around about how do you talk about coronavirus and, and that sort of thing. But we know children learn through play and we know that they learn through stories and narratives and um, and at the same time, run- um, I was a I was a, I was a runner. I was running quite seriously before lockdown, and then we couldn't go out and run. So I started doing more yoga, um, and just because I could do it at home, and I got the Down Dog app on my phone, and I was doing yoga every day. And while I was doing it, I was just so aware, from a sensory perspective, all the things that it was it was offering me, and a, a modulation perspective, and just thinking of the therapy that we do with kids, and how so many of those things, you know, the vestibular and the proprioceptive processing. Um, it's all so uh, it's so much a core part of yoga um, and then I was thinking of but how do you make it playful for children and the three just mm-hmm. kind of came together <laughs> so um, we wrote a story about a little gecko and he has to go on a journey of bravery so I drew on a lot of the social emotional learning things that I'd learned through Shan Lee and you know how we could use sort of affirmations to um really help children internalize that message of bravery. And um, I, I used a lot of rhyme uh, just from a language development perspective. Um, and um, I did these beautiful illustrations. And uh, then I approached a friend of mine who's a yoga instructor and I was like, come, we need to make a, well, this, the, the yoga course happened later. The idea mm. was there, but obviously these things take time. We're talking three years now. Yeah. Anyway, I approached Helen and I said, Helen, we've got the story. Let's turn it into into a, a yoga course for kids. So it's now being run as a holiday club because I mean it would be great to have it as an extra mural, but neither Helen nor I have time. So at the moment it's a it's a holiday course, um, and it goes with a book. And there's the little book of the little gecko. That's um, beautiful. And yeah, it's really I've become so fond of him, um, mm. and it's amazing. So uh, so it's a complete hi- side hustle, and um, it's kind of like a, a yoga OT hybrid. And then obviously with the storytelling and the play and, mm-hmm. um, and it's just so great because these kids can shape shift, you know, they can become the owl, they can become the cat, they can become the okay. Yeah. Um, so all those animal walks that we do in OT, it's just, you know, doing it in a, in a very story based way. Yeah. There's so many component skills that can be worked on. So we do it with sort of three to five year olds and then we do it six to nine year olds. Mm-hmm. And um, the, and then I, I just look at developmentally what you would want to achieve with those. And then we've, sort of made the postures around that and the transitioning for the postures. And obviously you've got the auditory processing components you can work on, you know, uh, just the musical statues kind of games where you call out the different post, you know, the different postures and you sequence them together. And so there's so many OT skills you can work on uh, in this really fun, playful way. Um, so yeah, you can so, buy the so book. So tell me how does the, yeah. So how does it go together? So you buy the book. So you can buy does... the book independently. Um, it's okay. But how does the story. holiday program uh, work so, so is so it just hol- you run it in the holidays and yeah, so we run it in the holidays my sister has nothing to do with the holiday program so my sister okay. and I are the book and Helen yeah. and I are the yoga okay. um, and then obviously the two are there's this bridge between the two because yeah. we're using the book for the yoga um and then so at the moment we do a three-day course and so you it's an hour a day for three days in a row and watching these children transform in those three days mm. is amazing and just get to know their bodies and their body awareness and um you know, how how they they internalize that message of bravery. So little Gecko says to himself when he can't go on, he's, little Gecko thinks he simply can't go on. And then mm. the voice inside him says, you are brave and you are strong. Mm. So you, we read the story and then we learn the different characters and we play some games. Um, and then by the end, when I read the story, I say, um, you know, and little he hears a voice inside him say, and then the little children are all like, "You are brave, and you are." Oh, strong. that's so cute! And it's so amazing <laughs> how they internalize it, and we do yeah. amazing things. So we, you know, we build a, you know, gecko crawls along the dry stone wall, and mm. afraid of the cold still night. Oh no, up ahead, a wild and scraggly cat. Mm. So I build a soft play, you know, out of soft play blocks. I build a wall, and then we put a crash mat at the end, mm. and it's so nice because when they're little, we build the wall for them. But then as they get older, there's that collaboration with themselves. Yeah, guys, I want you to use these blocks and build a wall. And then, you know, they don't know each other and they have yeah. to, you know, so there's social skills and those collaborative collaboration skills. Mm. They crawl along the wall. And then you just look at this vestibular processing and this body awareness. 
um, and how these children, and as they crawl and then they get to the top and then oh, Gecko sees the cat. And then, and then you say to the other children, what do we say? He's afraid. And then mm. all the children shout, you are brave and strong. And then these children just launch themselves <laughs> off the wall onto the crash mat. And it's so amazing to yeah. see how they become more confident in that, how they listen to, you know, what has been said. And yeah. it's just, it goes back to those skills that we've learned. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that activity analysis. It's that, um, it's that collaboration. It's joining all of these different um, mm. learning and developmental sort of principles together. Yeah. And it's, I, I, it's so rewarding anyway. So, and, and yeah, so, the, so the, so they, 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 they can buy the book or not. If they do the yoga course, they get a discount if they buy it, um, but they don't have to. So the book is used in the sessions, but they can have the takeaway. And then we've done some other really nice things. So we partnered with soil, which is mm. a, um, a essential oil, organic essential oil brand okay. and we're going to make us a blend. So they get little rollers as a gift and, and we include sort of the smell, obviously our, our sense Yeah, of so smell. you're integrating so, also like the sensory so processing, the well. sensory, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So they get to take away the little roller and they put it on their hands and they do this um, sort of affirmation, they smell and they say, I am brave and I am strong. And obviously the oils, I mean, I don't know a lot about essential oils, uh, mm-hmm. but the oils that we've used are all around protection and bravery. And it's a blend called Shield. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so even from a, a, a health perspective, it's supposed to shield you from, from germs and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that's nice. And then they get a little token at the end as well, which is their bravery token. And then we give some instruction to parents on how to use that, you know, when your child needs bravery. Um, and the way the story is written is, um, you know, we've got this negative bias in our brains. So mm-hmm. we flag the things that are dangerous to us. Yeah. Uh, so we actually have to teach children to focus on their successes uh, because our brains don't naturally do that. Um, yes. And so, you know, when Gecko, each time he has a new challenge, he says, no, I can't go in. But then he says, remember, you escaped from the owl and mm. then you got past the cat. And then remember, you got past the snake. And then the next animal, he goes through them again. So there's a lot of repetition on that, but just focus. And so the idea is like with the bravery token, when your child's feeling afraid, let's go get your token. Remember those things you did. You've been mm. scared when you've gone to new places before, but remember that time we went to Auntie So-and-so, there were new people you were brave, you know, mm. and then, and then the, ta- the token is just something tangible that they can hold on to. It's got a little picture of the gecko on and you're yeah. brave and you're strong. So, I mean, it's just. Yeah, I think I, really I think I like what you're saying is that basically, um, you know, a lot of what you're mentioning is all things that are evidence-based things you would use in therapy, yeah. but you've made it relatable, but not so relatable that it's another child and it's like a specific situation because it's animals. It's kind of like. Yeah still a fantasy thing and it's fun yeah. and whatever, but you can still relate to it because the character has a personality and it's a yeah. real life situation that's scary. But a lot of the things are actually evidence-based therapeutic principles. Like yeah. even what you were mentioning now about remembering your successes in the Private Practice Growth Academy, one of the lessons I teach is on the um, strengths-based resilience model, which is created by cognitive behavioral therapist Christine Podesky, which is exactly that, where you basically create a personal model of resilience based on previous situations where what skills you identify, what skills did you use in a previous situation? And then when you're in another situation where you feel like you can't get out of it and you don't know how to manage it, you basically refer to your personal model of resilience and identify what skills did you use there that you can apply now. And actually I did use it there. That's how I got through it. So this is how I can apply it here. And this is how mm-hmm. it, it's, it's like very, very science-based, like, you know, yeah, uh, jargony. And now yeah. what you've done is just con- you know, turn it into something that's easy to understand, mm-hmm. practical, tangible, um, and fun, which is so important when you're yeah, working exactly. with children. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, exactly. And but even I, like I, you know, no. there was actually so there's so many research um, articles on in the states where they found that instead of like you know replacing detention with um, mindfulness um, sessions, so, so instead much. of going yeah. to detention, you go to a session where you do either yoga or you yeah. do a mindfulness class with mm-hmm. deep breathing and all of that, and they found that it has been so much more successful where there's. Um, you know, there's less children like, you know, doing naughty things and things like that because they've introduced it. And, and 
Interestingly enough, there's another occupational therapist here in South Africa. I don't know if you know her, Sarah Allen. She no. has a, uh, yeah, so she's an occupational therapist. She's from uh, uh, the UK originally. And so she, she can't really work here. So she works as a, like in a, at an NGO or something. She works with children who are, uh, have gone through trauma and abuse. Um, and she's an artist as well. Um, so, she cre- so she started something called, it's called Sometimes I Feel. And then oh, she's created you know. all these um, resources. So, so it would be great if you connect to her and with her. So she's also uh, created a few books. Um, uh, the one is called uh, Marty Gets Lost or something like that. And it's also around like, you know, then he's lost and then like he asks for help and he's scared and yeah. all of these things. Amazing. And then she's got like these board yeah. games. She's made these board games like where you oh, actually yeah. like. So I bought quite a lot of her resources when I was working at the school. Um, and then you would play these board games and then you like have to like throw the dice and then it asks yeah. you a question and like you work through it um and she's and you know, she has toys and all of these things yeah. so um it just shows like you know like how you can think outside the box yeah. with your ot skills and knowledge and it doesn't always have to, it can sometimes be health promotion it doesn't always yeah, have absolutely. to be that you're only seeing people after they've already gone through stuff you can absolutely. actually prevent I'm- a lot of that well, it's you that know. well-known adage: prevent is is prevention's better than cure. Better than cure, and, yeah. And and I think I've always had this um, in my heart uh, because it, even when I was in London, I worked in a borough called Hackney, which is was at the time one of the sort of uh, boroughs of poverty, mm, one of the mm. boroughs of poverty of Hackney, and we were just getting really high referral numbers. So myself and Jackie Gordon, an amazing therapist I worked with there, we worked on something called the universal role. And it was basically to look at why were we getting such high referrals once mm. the children were getting to school? Um, because there was no reason developmentally why these children should be behind from a, you know, it should be, you, that should be fairly standard mm. um, and it was just looking at you know we mother the way we were mothered and so if you were brought up in poverty you you can have the best intentions at heart but if you weren't if you weren't given certain sort of developmental opportunities mm. as a child it's very hard to then go on and 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 do those with your children so a lot of the, we started the sort of the, the 10 a day so I, you know that you're supposed to have five to ten fruit and vegetables a day so we started this sort of 10 a day of 10 minutes of child they play a day kind of initiative working through mm. the children's and trying to get parents from from like when their children are born like it doesn't have to be a lot of time and we know you're busy and we know you're working and you know but can you do 10 minutes of child-led play and this is what that Mm. looks like so I think I've always had a um, a move towards this sort of more universal role the more health promotion role I think I also get quite frustrated because I think I mean we we share a passion of of ADHD, and I think that these are children who you you know with with neurodivergence the brain's just different, mm. and and so often the brain is told it's broken. And I just think of my brother so much growing up, and I think of my mom coming home from parent teacher meetings crying, and and I just mm. think that. Um, you know, if you can give children these skills from when they're young, if you can Mm. not be so punitive in the approach and you can teach them that mindfulness. I mean, imagine all of us, imagine we'd all had that from when we were young. We all knew how to focus on our strengths and and, uh, get resilience through that. And um, But I I just think that there's a lot of those, a a lot of those children that if we can share those skills with the people who are around those children. Yeah. um, that they have so much potential and they have so much to offer the world. Mm. Uh, and we're basically squandering that. We're squashing that yeah. in, in, our, yeah. in our current education system. And um, so, I, so I think, you know, even if I, again, it's one of those things that when you look back on your life, you realize the significance of things. And I think growing up with my brother and in the family situation, I mean, my parents had all the best intentions you know, they really wanted to support it, but not that much was known then. And they did yes. a lot of things right, but they got some things wrong and they, they can absolutely see that. And I, uh, you know, and it's not to apportion blame anywhere, but I just think that, you know, when you know better, you do better. So, mm. um, so there really is, it, we shouldn't be waiting for these children to be broken before, before we're trying to help yeah. them. Um, yeah, because I mean, like, um, my interest in ADHD is more around the adults, right? Because, yeah. Um, as we know, uh, the research previously, it was believed that you can outgrow ADHD. 
Yeah. Whereas now the scientific evidence shows that it's not, you don't actually outgrow it. What happens is that because life changes, the way that it presents, it presents as adult problems, which you yeah. don't see. So like if you have a child that is hyperactive, has a hyperactive type of ADHD and they're jumping all over the walls and they're like very busy and always breaking arms and all of that, it seems like an obvious like uh, issue that needs to be addressed. Now you have an adult, they're now not expressing themselves in the same way because they don't play necessarily, yeah. right? But yeah. the hyperactivity comes out in other ways. So yeah. it comes out in like adult problems. So yeah. it, it's somebody who is, oh, they're so unreliable. They need yeah. to finish always starting this idea. They're always starting this and they're always doing that. Yeah. They're all over the place. It was losing everything. Yeah. So you don't think of that as like hyperactivity yeah. or inattentiveness. You think of that as just a, a shitty human. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. You also and have so, all these associated anxieties and depressions yes. because they've internalized so much of the being told. Yes, they yes. Yeah. And so now, because we know more and the research is out there, and also because of the internet and like, you know, yeah. more people are advocating or educating around yeah. signs and symptoms of ADHD, a lot more adults on, there's a lot more adults now who are receiving late diagnosis in yeah. their 30s and 40s. And yeah, things yeah. Like that. And um, it's like you say, it's because we, there wasn't that much knowledge before. And, you know, like the older people always say, oh, we didn't have all this D&D, goodness is next out. You know, like we didn't have all of yeah, that. It's yeah. not that you didn't have it. It's because yeah. the people, the, the, they weren't diagnosed or yeah. also in a lot of communities and especially in, um, underprivileged communities, it's also a, a very uh, stigmatized thing in the sense of, I know in personally in, in my community in Cape Town, it was very like mental health issues or things that nobody should know about. Yeah. So yeah. I know of people in, in my extended family who have had like psych, psych, psychotic breakdowns or whatever. Um, in the older generation, it was like it's swept like nobody must know that yeah, the person yeah. went to hospital Absolutely. or whatever because it's like shameful, yeah. you know. So then it's like if people don't know about it, then they think it doesn't exist. Yeah. And then in the as as I got older and I have cousins, uh, like later on, it was like a new generation. It's like when my cousin had to go into Falkenberg, it was like, oh, then we all say, oh, you're going now to you. Like, you know, it was, yeah. we all knew about it and we yeah. would tease him and it was like a funny thing. Like his friends yeah. would go and drop him off when he must go for his thing. It wasn't like a shameful thing, yeah. you know, yeah. because it's changed now where people are becoming yeah. more open to talking about mental health. And so part of our role also is to foster that kind of thing in the next generation that it's, yeah. that it's okay to, and also yeah. this thing of like, I have this thing against like positivity porn, oh. you know, where it's like, oh, just be yes. positive and yeah, you know, yeah, it's fine to have those messages, but within the context of Absolutely. first deal with the negative emotions. Yeah. Now you'd be positive, but this whole thing of like, you're not allowed to be angry and you're not allowed to be negative and you're not allowed to have poor self-esteem. You can yeah. have all those things. It's about having awareness of them and then learning to process them and in healthy ways. It's not Absolutely. about pretending they aren't there and just being strong and putting on a brave face, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, so we need to kind of, cause there's, there's been that shift of, you know, don't admit you have problems to, admitting you have problems but then saying like you can do this to now we need to move it towards a more holistic view of we all have issues yeah. and it's well, okay it's a, yeah and let's be a yeah it's amazing this uh, sorry I, I i get so excited about this but just exactly what you're saying so i'm working with these children in this group right this yoga mm. group that are three to five they're tiny yeah. and six to nine and already they've internalized so i say to them but was he was brave and what is bravery mm. and Almost without exception, every child says bravery is when you're not scared. You don't, mm. you're not scared. You don't feel scared. Yeah, the whole thing of fearless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then we have to talk about that. And we're like, no, but he was scared. And he should have been scared. There was a big owl. You could eat. Mm. Bravery is not when you're not scared. Mm. Bravery is when you are scared. You can't be brave if you're not scared. You mm. have to be scared to be brave. Because mm. bravery is when you're scared, but you do the right thing anyway. Anyway, it's yeah. It's important and it's the right thing. And it's like it's like revolutionary for these yeah. children. Like, yeah. Because that's the thing. You can be scared and be brave. That is exactly mm. when you are brave. But that's yeah. from how young children are being conditioned that yeah. these uncomfortable feelings are not allowed. These yeah. uncomfortable feelings, they're not good. And it's really just because the world finds big feelings uncomfortable mm, we don't mm. like to have to deal with other people's disappointment yeah. and sadness and shame yeah. because we don't know how to deal with our own 
Yeah. So imagine from a young age, we could make children be okay with the whole palette of colors. You yeah. can have all of these colors in your existence, not just half of them, not just the yeah. comfortable ones. I mean, what more beautiful a picture would you get? Tell me something about, um, I'd like to know a little bit about the actual, like, you know, process of, so now you wrote the story and your sister did the illustrations and all of that, but the actual act of getting the book published, like what were some of the biggest obstacles that you have to overcome or like, like I wouldn't know where to start even if I okay, had so I, don't, I have no idea where to start. So, <laughs> so I, firstly, I have to say that it's self-published. So I didn't go to a publishing house mm. um, and I, I consulted quite a few people Quite a few people were just like, well, you know, you can go to a publisher, but you have to sell 15,000 books or whatever before mm. you can cover your co- And it just, it's, it was too daunting for me. I was completely overwhelmed and I was yeah. like, shelf. <laughs> so it, it did get shelved. I mean, this was, this, the book was technically written and illustrations done in 2020. When Helen and I started speaking more about the yoga and when I was doing my clinical practice and I wanted to include that more, I was like, I really have to resurrect this book. I have to. Mm, mm. Uh, so I, I have a lady who does the graphic design of my, um, of my uh, trainings that I do. She just sort of goes over them and amalgamates it and whatever. So I contacted her and I just said to her, listen, I have the images and I have the words and I don't have the skill set to put it together how many hours would this take you? What? And so, so we sort of worked on that. And so she kind of put the words and the text together. It was a bit of a back and forward process. Cause I mean, I don't know. I don't know what is going to appeal to other people. I know it looks nice to me, you know, um, yeah. and then other things as well, which, um, which I've thought about subsequently in terms of like visual perception and our development of mm. visual perception, you know, when you're looking at it, can you see, you know, there's that sort of visual literacy. So if you see a part Mm. of something, can you, you know, can you see that they see the whole, the whole, and, you know, so those sort of things came into it, which I don't think actually most children's book, I mean, I suppose if you've studied children's illustration, you've probably learned that, um, which my sister hasn't done. um, And, and I didn't think of it at the time. So it's quite interesting. We did think of the language we used Mm. um, and, Anyway, so that was a bit of a process, but she put it together. And then I actually just said, well, what are the printers that you've worked with? And um, and so we got some quotes from the different printers and how they were able to do it. Um, and I learned a little bit about different printing styles, obviously, because it's a, a book where you've got images and, and mm. that sort of thing. Um, and I, and so, so, and, and then we sort of pulled our own resources to fund printing it. And I worked out what was the least I could sell it for to mm. try and cover the cost. How many books would I have to sell? That sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I only printed 250 <laughs> because it's really expensive to print. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I have sold enough to cover the cost. So, okay. so that's awesome. Well done. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and we've got another two books that have been written that are busy being illustrated. So the idea is that it will be a sequence of um It'll be a sequence of stories all focusing on a different social emotional learning area. Yeah. So this is bravery. Our next one is self-belief. It's about a little uh, caterpillar uh, who knows that he's got something to offer the world and he metamorphosizes into a butterfly, but he doesn't know it's coming. And then we've got a, a circus uh, bear, a bear who joins, uh, who's the ringmaster wants him to dance. And that's about growth mindset because mm. he can't do it, but uh, he, awesome, he can't yeah. do it yet. And it's the, the use of the word yet and how you can get children to, mm. so the affirmations around, I just can't do it yet. But the more I practice and the more I try. Mm. Um, so they're really sweet stories. And um, yeah, so, so we'll, we'll, I'll, I think I'll go through the same process with those at some point, I guess, Obviously, the more you print, the cheaper it is. So at some point, yeah. we'll ha- we'll hit a tipping point. So I'm going to have yeah. to do another rerun of this if I keep doing the yoga courses because when you do the yoga courses, mm. you need the book um, and you yes. want to buy it. So it's just going to be I'm going to have to learn, I suppose. Mm. Uh, how mm. many do you print? How many do you keep for courses? How many do you sort of – I mean, we, I've had amazing response to this book, just people who follow me online and – um, and actually, really interestingly, a lot of um, of my my parents' friends who now have grandchildren, mm. uh, who I think they knew me growing up, and uh, so so 
you know, you leverage your, you leverage the the networks you have. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but it's great because it's getting out there and I, I don't know where it's going to go. Ideally, I suppose longer term, could we create this uh, package of OT um, uh, yoga, so we've, we're calling it yoga, mm. <laughs> um, uh, courses that can then be franchisable to other OTs mm. or to, um, to yoga instructors who want to work with kids. You could even put the yoga course online and do an yeah, online version. Yes. So <laughs> or you could even version. create your characters from your book and be actual plush toys. Like, yeah. Um, so, well, there's the whole merchandising. Yeah. Side and you can yeah, make it yeah. weighted yeah. toys so that you yeah, can make exactly. it Exactly. So, we do, so we do mindful <laughs> breathing. So that is yeah. one of the plans. So like, like with little Gecko now, we talk about your heart beating fast and how mm. you can bring it down. So we give them bean bags on their stomachs. So the idea yeah. is if we then franchise you know do we have little gecko mats yoga mats we have a ring we have like our rollers that are little gecko stickers on and you know you get a token from each of the courses you do um so like that is you know in terms of side hustle because you're thinking of it as a business as well Mm. right Mm. i mean it's definitely it's it's a passion project but it's Mm. it's definitely yeah it's got to be lucrative enough to be worth your time because otherwise you and know. for it to be sustainable, I think exactly. people forget exactly. that, you know, we always put this spin on like, the thing. And it's what you mentioned right at the beginning, you know, the guilt of charging people yeah, and like absolutely. you're a sellout. But people forget that nothing is actually free. So even yeah. if you are working for government, that money comes from somewhere. Absolutely. Somebody's still paying yeah. for it. Even yeah. if you are a charity, somebody still yeah. has to fork it's out the money funded. for it. Yeah. So you you now feel all good about yourself because you're doing it for our, yeah. without <laughs> paying, but somebody else is still yeah. paying it for yeah. you to be able to feel good about yourself. Yeah. So yeah. it's you have to also think about what is sustainable. Yeah. And if you are wanting to not necessarily make profit from something then you need to look at okay then it's a non-profit company still somehow you need to make it sustainable absolutely and actually yeah. i have interviewed um somebody called um brandon from the walk with brandon foundation he's uh, a paraplegic and they started the therapy um this therapy center which is a chat it's a completely charitable center they do loud donations and that and so i will link to that video as well because this one is coming out yeah. before this one um where it's really about like you know you still have to run it like a business even yeah. though you're not making a profit because yeah. your people that you are working for, that are working for you, the therapists that work for the center, they still need to be paid, you know, the, if they want to invest in the great equipment. Otherwise you're going to just be a fly by night charity that yeah. starts today and ends tomorrow. And then who are yeah. you going to help? Then you're yeah. not helping anybody. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, we need to get out of this mindset. And I say that from personal experience that I've thought like that before. And I still have to like sometimes yeah. check myself that, you know, and I used to get so angry with my husband when he used to say, oh, it's just a hobby. You know, it's just a hobby. I'm like, no, it's not just a hobby. It's like making a difference in people's time. Like, yeah. yes, but like, what are you getting out of it? Yeah. It's yeah. Not, you know, and then, but like, the, I would get angry with him, but in the back of my mind, I knew he was right. You know, yeah, and I would yeah. always just think, ah, it's you coming with your corporate, corporate yeah, experience yeah. and you don't understand how it works. Yeah, yeah. Like I would say that, yeah. but I, you have to, like, you just have to be real with yourself and understand that at the end of the day, it's, if it's not sustainable, it's not going to last and then you're not going to help anyone. <laughs> yeah. And you can be, I mean, that's why I really, I really like the sort of, I didn't realize, you know, social enterprise is something as well, right? Yeah, like and they are, and they and can be for profit. So I think, like to end off with, I'd like to just ask you to share with those um, who may be watching, who are in private practice or not even in private practice, but they have this idea or they, that they want to use their knowledge or skill, they've noticed a need um, and they have this idea that they think that can be a spin off. What advice would you give to those who are thinking of like, you know, lo- going yeah. into it as yeah. a side hustle? <laughs> so it's, it's, it, it's a really good question because I got completely immobilized at quite a few times along the way. And then I was chatting to this guy who's very much an entrepreneur and he would, he just said to me, he kept saying to me, Rachel, Minimum viable product, minimum viable product. Yeah. And I was like, but it's so embarrassing. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Gonna and like, and I, I, the shame of like something that wasn't perfect. And that yes. was something I really had to overcome in myself. Yeah. I, mean, like, <laughs> I think that I have this in me, this natural, I call it perfectionism. I don't know, but it's this fear of not mm. doing things that are perfect. And that mm-hmm. is my journey has really been 
No, it's about minimal viable product. Mm, You put mm. out there the most minimum version and you make it better and it will grow organically and it will grow the way it's supposed to go and it will grow responsibly as well. So have an idea and just start. Like, And I Mm. remember as a child, my mom would say, clean your bedroom. You're not playing until your bedroom's clean. And my sister and I shared a room and our room was tough. And I would just start crying because I'd be like, we're never going to play because I don't know. And she would hold my face in her, in her hands and she would, she would say, Rach, one thing, pick up one thing and put it away. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, and, and like, that's really what it is. I mean, with yeah. this book, it was like, okay, what's, what's the next step? What is the mm. next step? It doesn't have to be perfect. And if you get it wrong, that's okay. And, mm. and like, don't be afraid to show people. Like, because they're your friends. They love you. They don't want you to fail. And they'll say to you, oh, Rach, that doesn't really work, but this is awesome, you know? Yeah. And then, so so minimum viable product would be my advice. Just get the first step. It will grow. It will grow organically. It will grow beautifully. And it will grow responsively to what the need is. Yes, I think that what you're saying about responsibly is so important. The feedback part is so important. So I can relate to that also with the Private Practice Growth Academy. It was an idea I had. And it started off as a community. And if I had to wait until it was perfect, I would never have launched it. it happened, and I remember yeah. the first, the first um, in, in, uh, incoming members that I had for the academy. Um, I didn't even have any lessons there, and I, but I made it clear like there is nothing there. We're gonna build this together. Yeah. And then um, you know I would teach the lessons live, and then the recordings would go into the academy. But then it wasn't working out, and then I would I said, okay, look, I'm gonna. I'm going to close it now and I'm going to relook, but I need you to guys to give me feedback of what worked, what didn't work, but you will have, you'll be lifetime legacy members. I call them the legacy yeah. members. So they have <laughs> yeah. forever access to everything like, I, yeah. I, so that if, you know, as, when I improve the product now, you will, and that's what a lot, and it comes from that whole, you know, it comes from the tech space, you know, the, the iterations where you, you release the minimal viable product, but the people who are the early adopters, they generally are the type of people who actually are going to, they're not going to be hard on you because they know they're early adopters and they, yeah. they, they're they coming on board to an, an incomplete product, but you yeah. need to make it then worth their while that yeah. they are, are coming on early, but you reward them generously. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of the times in the tech space, what that means is life, like if it's a subscription product, the person who came in at the beginning will always have lifetime yeah. access. So they yeah. never have to pay again. And, yeah. um, but it has to be, a, again, it comes into that thing of sustainable. Like I could have then released a free product, but I'm not going to get the same type of person joining. Yeah. Yeah. The early adopter, yeah. true early adopter is the person who is actually willing to like put their money down and say, I'm yeah. willing to give you a chance and try yeah. this. And they're going to be more critical and give you the right kind Absolutely. of feedback yeah. compared to somebody who's going to join because it's free and then they never actually engage with it and they never actually fill in the feedback form. And yeah. they, you know, So I actually had not just a feedback form, I actually met one-on-one with each of the original members and we had a discussion <clears throat> around what worked, what didn't work. So the new, by the time I was ready to release the Private Practice Academy this year, it was really based on their feedback. And it was, yeah. and now I can already see as people are going through the program, I have checkpoints where they have to give feedback on what they learned from the lesson and why they yeah. found it. And the feedback has been amazing because it's yeah. based on what people need. You know, yeah. and and that is so important. So I think that is great advice. Just go out there and do it. Don't worry about what other people are yeah. going to think. As long as you you have something that is a usable product that people can actually like give you proper feedback. Yeah. And then the really it must ha- be about that having that growth mindset of yeah. I can I can improve this. I can change yeah. this. If it doesn't work out. What can I do to make it better? It's not about it's either it works or it doesn't, you know. Yeah. And you don't need all the skills when you set mm-hmm. out. You can yeah. learn, you can prioritize the skills you need as you need them. Yeah. Uh, but it also, that takes patience because as I said, this is three years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And life is happening at the same time. So, you, yeah. you know, with the side hustle, the toys. Um, but, yeah. but those are definitely growth things in myself. Yeah. Uh, I don't think a younger Rachel would have done yeah. this. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and then, and then from that, I, I can be like the gecko and then you get your courage because then you go, hey, you didn't know how to publish a book and you did it. So yeah. <laughs> and then that just, yeah, that knock on a 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been so interesting. I think we could probably end up talking like a whole day. <laughs> so I think we must better put it into this before yeah. we do carry on for the whole day. But it's been amazing chatting to you about this. I can't wait to get a copy of my book. Like I told you, I'm going to send. So I always send, like even with the African Affirmations cards, I bought a copy for my my daughter, my sister has a daughter and she's an empath so um this is the kind of thing that she yeah. will absolutely love um so i'm excited yeah. to hopefully she will i will i will send you the payment and she will get it before this video comes out because now i'm <laughs> yes, like, be awesome. getting all it's supposed to be a surprise <laughs> that she will just receive the book at her door yeah um so i'm really excited for that and Thank to you. see what the illustrations my sister's also an artist by the way Amazing. and I've been, I, I, I and i hope she listens to this because she she does fine art and she does um art for art social um facilitation workshops with la lela project so they in the townships they do oh, like wow. art life Thank skills you. groups and things like that and she's been working on a children's book for ages and i've oh. been like telling her you need to, but i know she's really yeah. busy because she's, yeah. she's so busy and um, she obviously wants to do our own illustrations and things yeah. like that so i i hope that she watches this and it puts yes. some fire under a bum that she can actually self-publish and not have to worry yeah. about because that. that's yeah. the part that's actually tripping her up it's the so of, you know once the book is finished yeah. and it's publish how do i do yeah. it all of that stuff um Absolutely. yeah so thank you so much it's been wonderful thank you for yeah. having me it's good luck so with the good luck with the book and the series i can't wait to see where it all goes great thank you so much bye